The following podcast was recorded on Wednesday, April 7th, 2021, featuring Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science discussing credit market volatility expectations. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to our latest edition of Talking Data. I'm Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, and I'm joined today by Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. Welcome, Ben. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the credit market volatility expectations, and we've got quite a few charts to go through today. Um, we're gonna to get started with global liquidity and solvency risks. They remain ultra low, according to the financial markets. What's the latest, Ben? So this is something that's confounded uh, almost all investors really since the you know the really the weeks after the fed kind of came in and saved the day in uh, mid to late march of 2020 so we saw solvency risks and liquidity risks as measured via cds you know credit default swaps spread relationships and rates currencies and so on um just absolutely uh you know take a dive lower so we have a chart here that shows b of a's global liquidity and solvency risks and it's kind of shown like a financial conditions index so anything really low means that things are very easy and less financial stress and you can see that uh, uh, for the most part liquidity which again the fed's been buying uh treasuries tips mbs and so on um has is improved markedly um in a lot of cases we're seeing these liquidity premiums that were built into specific markets like tips uh fall and even become negative which is which is pretty interesting solvent uh the solvency side the degree of bankruptcy activity that a lot of individuals forecasted for late 2020 early 2021 uh had really not come to fruition and i think this has been the kind of the confusing space we had this pandemic this sudden stop but we've kind of filled the gaps um, and seen a pretty quick rebound in, in confidence, now a, a kind of revitalization of manufacturing and these solvency risks have, are just, just not there. Let's move next to the US high yield credit. That one is, that one is definitely plummeting. This is what is pretty wild is that high yield credit and the volatility expectations using, for example, HYG's options have, have, have just, uh, fallen off the map for the most part relative to other asset classes. So as we know, beginning in some, you know, maybe the first or second week of, Feb of February, we all became kind of more concerned about the potential for tapering and rate hikes. Uh, we saw the euro dollar curve, Fed funds futures start to price in rate hikes um, kind of sooner um, and closer and closer. If you look between, for example, December 2023, December 2021, we're now pricing, not we, but the futures are pricing in, you know, 80 to 100 basis points of tightening. So that lifted some of the, the volatility structure expectations for uh, pretty much everything, uh, except for really high yield. So whereas commodities were on fire, you know, with copper, tin, nickel, and so on, that volatility um, has been high kind of persistently, but we saw investment grade credit, some of their vol rise, treasuries appreciably, which makes sense with the rate hike fears, and the S&P 500. But um, all that started to recede as the Fed is committed to you know, AIT framework, and we're starting to see a little bit of a relaxing in, in volatilities, but high yield is in a, in a you know, place on its own. Um, so we have a chart here that shows on a Z-score basis, so for easier comparison, the three-month implied volatility using options for each of these categories. And high yield is now significantly below um, nearly everything else on a Z-score basis. And if you look at it on a raw percentage, you know, it's running closer to 5%, whereas investment grade is much higher at 7%. But yes, we have a, a large duration difference between high yield and investment grade, but it's still kind of an oddity to see high yield, the junkiest, uh, you know, of bonds having such an incredibly low degree of volatility. And a lot of that might have to do with, again, the, the reach for yield and the hope of finding return in this environment, because triple C credit, for example, is one of the last places that you could do that. And I think we show that on the next slide as well. Right, so triple C to triple B rated uh, you know, corporate bonds have absolutely, you know, come in in terms of the spread of the difference between their OAS. 
So we'd blown out to almost 1,500 basis points or 15%, and that's done nothing but crater uh, now to one standard deviation below its median, almost at you know 400 basis points or 4%. Historically, this has you know, been a point of um, kind of, if you want to call it resistance, um, uh, four triple Cs. We saw lows uh, formed in the same area in June, July of 2014, and then again in July of 2018. So now is it, the big question is now that we've seen this reach for yield and this exuberance um, you know, helped by Fed purchases initially in 2020, is this something that we should start to maybe get concerned about that we've kind of seen the this reach for yield run its course? And we have one more slide we'll show on that as well. And then next, Ben, let's move over to implied credit volatility. Um, that's still the odd man out. Um, and we've got, just, we can show some different sectors here. So this shows, this is a chart put together by Anthony Rizzo, one of our, our colleagues. And here what we're showing is the ratio of implied volatility for each asset class to uh, credit. And so we're averaging essentially the implied volatility for LQD, investment grade credit, and then high yield HYG. And what we're seeing is uh, you know, quite a rebound in these ratios and most specifically with tips and swaption volatility. And tips in this case is going to be related to real yields and how much you know that volatility is expected to move, and um, it means that high yield is kind of diverging um, in terms of its overall volatility profile from you know volatility expectations for tips, especially for the short end of the curve using swaps and volatility for how you know how volatile the two-year and five-year rates be over the next you know two to five years. So we're getting this this heavy detach. Um, which I think is concerning and might be signs of you know a little bit of exuberance and euphoria for some of this higher higher yielding um, debt. And the next chart will show the correlation since 2016 and compare it to the correlation for the last 30 days. This is you know I think very interesting in that not surprisingly the credit markets you know historically have been tied to risk assets. So if you look back you know to 2016 to current at these correlations, you find credit there. You'll see the darker blues you know for currencies, EM equities and equities in general. I mean that make that makes sense. Now that's somewhat faded over the past 30 days and really over the past you know 90 days and uh, what's most interesting is that nominal yields don't seem to matter as much for the credit markets so everyone's kind of uh, you know freaking out about one and a half percent and then now maybe two percent for 10-year note yields the nominal side but its correlation in terms of volatility is not that high. And in fact, it's actually slightly negative. But where there, there is a stronger connection has to do with the real yield component or tips. And so uh, for credit markets over the past 30 days and a little bit more, the highest correlation in terms of their, their volatility is to tips and to real yields. So that may mean that real yields are the, uh, you know, the kind of metric you need to watch going forward once we get an appreciable rise in that, which will be on the heels of likely tapering talks and rate hike talk again, um, that is what could end up hurting and bruising the high yield market. So here we show the correlation um, on a rolling one month basis and it's smooth between real yields, tips yields, and the average of HYG and LQD's uh, volatility expectations or implied volatility. And as Anthony noted in a piece, this is now the highest in a decade and again, this is not the same case for nominal yields um, in that we're seeing you know, a large rise in term premium um, as well as a little bit in inflation. Um, that is not as tied to the story. What's really tied to the story is you know, these lethargic uh, real yields. And five-year real yields have really gone nowhere. And 10-year real yields have you know, popped a little bit, but have got, skated sideways for the past number of weeks. But we need to see a break higher in those you know, real growth and then also the Fed um, and central banks in general turning a little bit more hawkish to get those to rise until that happens. Maybe this party can continue for a little bit longer, but you got to remember you're up against resistance uh, technically in many different ways. In our one of our last few slides here we're going to walk through today, this goes back to U.S. high yield corporates and diverging from other assets. So what we've done is we've taken, just like we do with a lot of other fair value models, let's let's take you know the, the implied volatility for equities, treasuries, commodities, and this is a long list of over a dozen different individual markets, and estimate where should high yields 
volatility be uh, in terms of their implied volatility. And that's why we model. So we have the estimate in orange and, and the blue shows the actual. And so the actuals come down, as I said before, to just above 5%, whereas using all other markets suggests quite convincingly that it should be uh, more elevated towards, you know, 7 uh, 0.4%, so it should be almost, you know, you know, 40% higher than it is right now. So the residual is large, and again, showing how much high yield credit, much more than investment grade credit, is sticking out like a sore thumb. Now, no, we're not saying it's going to get demolished, and this is going to be the, you know, a high yield credit event. Uh, we're just saying that the easy money is likely over and 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 been made, and I think that investors are somewhat hip to that in that we've seen flows into high yield and investment rate corporate bond ETFs uh, slow quite a bit. And that's been the case for the past number of months. And we even saw into the end of March, some pretty heavy selling that's bounced back a little bit this month. But I think investors understand the reward to risk ratios are not going to be as great as they had been, certainly on the heels of the Fed purchases and then on this the reopening vaccine waves and so on. And our last slide today, Ben, that I'll ask you to walk us through here, compares uh, the U.S. dollar and 10-year real yield changes compared to the other industries. So what we want to do is show, uh, so what happens, and this is kind of what has been happening a little bit, is what happens if 10-year real yields continue to rise, and we also get a little bit of a bounce, continued bounce in the U.S. dollar. Now, we've been bullish on the dollar since the first or second week of January due to the expectation the shadow rates in the, in the U.S. would rise much faster than the ECB and elsewhere. So I think this is a scenario that is, um, should be in the forefront of credit investors' minds. In this, in this case, we're looking at investment grade credit for the reason that this is a scenario that could end up biting them uh, the most. So let's say, let's say that the dollar and the real yields on a, on a weekly change basis rise more than one standard deviation. We filtered then since 2004 for what is the, you know, the array of returns by industry group. And that's what you see here in a box and, box and whisker chart. So focus in on these red uh, square, squares or rectangles. That shows the median in the middle and then the 25th and 75th percentile. Now, a lot of this is going to move with duration. So the higher the duration, the more you're likely to, you know, to get bruised by um, when, uh, when real yields do rise. But some of this too is not necessarily as intuitive. But for those that want to burrow in and say, okay, if this does happen and we do get the scenario where, where you know, high yield investment grade credit is rich, and if we do get this pop in yields and the potential in the dollar, you know, where could I be uh, bruised most? And again, higher duration, not surprising with like railroads, utilities, and so on, um, versus something like airlines, home construction, and banking, um, where we would expect them to be less impacted, um, uh, typically due to their shorter duration profiles. Um, but also, I think that a lot of our other work is suggestive that that space, airlines, banking, and so on, will actually do uh, better in this environment going forward with uh, with the reopening uh, in general. So, bottom line uh, is that the um, you know the high yield market. Triple C's in particular have been on quite a run. Uh, the tightening relative to triple B's to 400 basis points is technically, you know, showing an overbought indication. And we want to want uh, in our clients to be watching real yields as closely as possible. Specifically, the five-year maturity is what we're focused in on the most, since that's just been stuck sideways for quite some time. If we can get appreciable pop uh, in real yields, that's when you should be concerned about both investment grade credit and high yield credit and the potential finally, not that this is a good thing, but finally, um, you know, for some more meager to, to negative returns. Well, thank you, Ben, for your thoughts today. We really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent offerings are Bianca Research and Arbor Data Science. For any questions or further information, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day.